Hello. Thanks for coming tonight. We're going to get started. Um, I'm Alice Demergen. I'm the director of the Fashion Marketing Program in the School of Fashion. And uh, I'd like to mention a few people who've helped to develop and support the Rethinking Fashion series. And that's Tamara Albu, who's here, and James Mandolia, as well as Simon Collins, the dean of the Fashion School. Um, Rethinking Fashion is a series of conversations with companies that are implementing environmental and social consideration into each stage of their development decisions. We're thrilled to have Lexi Funk here tonight, the CEO of Brooklyn Industries, for the sixth event in our series. Artist turned entrepreneur Lexi Funk is the co-founder of Brooklyn Industries, a company born out of the need to find a sustainable way of life without sacrificing an individual's creative drive. This philosophy is reflected in the company's first product, a bag made out of recycled billboards. In the past 11 years, Brooklyn Industries um, has grown to uh, a men's and women's lifestyle retailer with 13 stores in four states and a successful e-commerce site. Please join me in welcoming Lexi Funk. Thank you. Okay, great. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, so the way that I set this up was uh, to sort of as a series of narratives um, that I can discuss with you um, so that I can walk you through sort of uh, not only what we're doing but also the thought process behind what we're doing because uh, a big part of Brooklyn Industries is that it's very organic. We've grown organically but also our idea process and how we come up with clothing, how we come up with marketing campaigns, uh, even where we open stores is, is uh, not set in stone and it's very non-corporate. So it, it sort of happens through a thought process. So the first thing I wanted to do was to sort of backtrack and tell you a little bit about where we came from. So I'm, I'm calling this, uh, this part the dream of being an artist, which is what I wanted to do when I left university. And then the actuality that I ended up, which is that um, entrepreneurialism, and I hope that's spelt right, um, is very, very creative, that the act of uh, forming a company and then making fashion and then actualizing fashion in a vertical retail environment, I think now is just as creative and is more rewarding for myself and, and our teams than the solo artistic process. But it took a while to get there. So um, if I backtrack to 1991, I graduated from Wesleyan University, which is a liberal arts college in, Conne in Connecticut. And I moved to Williamsburg uh, thinking that I wanted to completely escape um, the sort of capitalist mechanism that I thought was very uh, entrenching and I, I wanted to escape it. And the idea there was I thought that you know people just make money to spend money to make money to spend money, which doesn't really sound like the ideology of somebody who ends up starting a retail clothing company, but that was very much my thought process when I was 20 years old. And I thought that by making art, and my art at the time was photography and installation art that I could get out of this mech, you know, this sort of uh, capitalist economy, that I could just escape it. Um, but I was, I was presented with a reality when I got to New York that hopefully you will never have to face, which is you know, that you have to make a living, and what you do to make a living is not always what you love. Um, and hopefully you will always make a living in what you love, or, but that doesn't always happen. Um, so when I was 21, I started to work. Um, my first job was on a film set. My second job was taking pictures at weddings. My third job was uh, being a photo assistant. My fourth job, and some of these jobs overlap, my fourth job was uh, working in a photo processing center. And I did all kinds of things. And I always tried to work part time. And I lived in Williamsburg because it was very cheap. Um, but I always worked part time because I was trying to uh, launch my art career. And I had some success in my, in my art career. I uh, had, a, had a solo show at Franklin Furnace, um, which is sort of an underground, uh, it's moved around a couple of places, but it's an underground art gallery. I also attended the Whitney Independent Studio Program, which was at the time a very sort of academic, intellectual place for artists. Um, but after four years of this life, I was feeling very 
um, disconcerted. And what was disconcerting me was that I felt as if I had no impact on the world, that I was doing my art, but my art was always being shown in, in indie galleries outside of a system. And then I thought, well, how am I ever going to have an impact on the world working in my photography studio? You know, that was my sense. I had a dark room that I set up in Williamsburg. So there was a sense of, yes, I'm surviving and I'm following my passion, but I'm never going to do anything different. I'm never going to make an impact. And what I did in 94 was I packed up my dark room and I packed up my art studio and I said, I'm going to go to Russia and I'm going to wander around for four months taking uh, photographs. And that was sort of my... I'm fed up with New York. And again, I hope nobody ever gets to this point, you know, if you're young graduates. I'm just fed up with New York. I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. So I left and I went to Russia. And I walked around for three months in the cold taking pictures. And a lot of those pictures uh, are in the Union Square store on the wall right now. Um, so if you'd like to see them, they're there. Um, and then I ended up in, in Poland, uh, again, doing art installations and photography. Um, and this was all sort of money I had saved while I was, while I was uh, in New York. I returned in 1995, and I met my partner, who I started this business with, who end, ended up being my husband um, and my partner. And we met at an art residency in upstate New York. And we moved back to New York City. And again, the, the whole cycle began again. I was working in an ad agency as a freelancer, my partner was running Stingy Lulu's on the Lower East Side, and we again had this problem of how to connect art and commerce. Like, how do you make a living and still make art? And in, uh, a year later, in uh, 1996, um, it was unfortunate but also lucky in that my grandfather died and left me a small uh, $40,000. And so it was enough money to stop working and start a company. And it was very much that sort of entrepreneurial spirit that started coming out, which is, we just have to start a company. What do we know how to do? And we thought, well, we know how to brand and we know how to design things, so let's start a branding company. And we really had no clue what we were doing whatsoever. It was a very sort of spontaneous action. Um, and I remember at one point cold calling I had a list of advertisers, and I cold called all these advertisers trying to get work from them. So it was very much sort of desperate measures to try and get work. We slowly got work, um, but again, it was it was challenging, you know, because there's a lot of design firms in New York. There are many reputable people, and we were the only thing we had going for us is that we both had art careers. Um, so it wasn't until it wasn't until 1997 that uh, we, we stumbled, and I say stumbled because it really was, we stumbled upon this idea of using billboard material uh, in a bag. Um, and the, my partner brought the material home to uh, our studio, and the material sat on our, on our floor, and we kept saying, well, how, what are we going to do with this? And one idea we had was, well, we're going to turn it into a painting. I was like, well, that, I don't know if it's going to be such an exciting painting. And the other idea we had was, well, let's turn it into an anorak. And we did make an anorak out of the Billmore material, but it was, you know, you kind of walked around like this. <laughs> and it wasn't that great an anorak. And at the same time, bike messengering was sort of coming up as this cool thing. So bike messaging had been around for a while, but there was sort of a lot of energy around bike messaging, bike messer messengering. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to make a messenger bag out of the billboard material? It's waterproof. Each one's individual. It's recycled. Um, what a great concept. So it was, it was sort of this, you know, this, this thing that came together with the material. So we made a couple of bags, and we took it to a trade show at the Javits Center, uh, which I had Somebody told me about the, the trade show, so we took it to the trade show, and we had a beautiful display. And again, pricing, pricing. we didn't know how to price it. It was just we sort of pulled a number out of our hat. And people started writing orders, and it was, it was pretty amazing. I, I mean, sort of 
I, I don't know if we thought people would write orders, but people started writing orders. Other stores, Antique Boutique, I don't know if anyone remembers Antique Boutique, but Antique Boutique wrote some orders, some Japanese companies wrote some orders, and all of a sudden we had a big problem, which is we have to make more bags. <laughs> How are we going to make more bags? Because we're in this nice design studio in Chelsea. We're supposed to be a branding firm, and all of a sudden, we're moving these huge billboards to the roof. We're washing them. We're cutting them. We're hiring sewers. And the landlord said, thank you very much. You don't belong here anymore. You got to move somewhere else. And we were like, well, where do we go? And where did we go? But back to Williamsburg, uh, because Williamsburg was, had not sort of uptrended at that time. We, we, uh, we, we rented a factory for $3,000 about 3,000 square feet with sort of a, a small space on top on North 11th and Wythe Avenue in uh, Williamsburg, and we started manufacturing. Um, so it was sort of the mother of necessity brought us into the billboard bag, which brought us to the trade show, which then brought us to the Williamsburg factory, which then brought us to this point in our life where we became bag manufacturers. So it was very uh, discontinuous, but it, it did end up happening. Um, so from 1997 to 2000, um, we designed and made the billboard bags. But then the billboard bags morphed into other messenger bags, which morphed into handbags, which then morphed into t-shirts, which then morphed into sweatshirts. And we sort of grew the business slowly from one category to the next, um, still maintaining a manufacturing core. Uh, about a year after we moved into the factory, we decided that in order to finance our business, one of the key things that we would do was to let go of our apartment on the Lower East Side. So we moved into the factory. And we thought that this would be a, a, a moment in time, that this would, you know, our business would just skyrocket and orders would flow in and miraculously we would just you know, not be living in the factory. But unfortunately, we lived in the factory for about two and a half years. Um, and that's really where the motto of our company, Live, Work, Create, came from, which is it was materially at the time a movement that artists had in Williamsburg, which was a movement to allow them to live in industrial spaces. At the time, Williamsburg was mostly zoned industrial. So people were living in huge loft spaces, but the fire department kept coming and saying, you have to, you have to leave or you're not allowed to move, you're not allowed to live here, and they'd find them, and often they'd kick them out. So we started doing t-shirts uh, out of this artist movement saying, live, work, create, meaning you should be able to live where you work and you should be able to create where you live, which was also the same experience that we had sort of out of necessity, which is that we were living and working in the factory in Williamsburg. And it wasn't until quite a bit later in 2002 or 2003 when we already had a couple of stores, and we had an intern from an MBA program, and she said, well, you have a company and you have all these great ideas, but you really need a motto. And we're like, we need a motto. What, why do we need a motto? And she said, well, well, you need a motto because you need to synthesize all the ideas that you're putting into your company. And you need to synthesize it so that it's very easy for people to pick up on it. And so we sort of dug into our archives and into our history, and we said, well, Live, Work, Create, that T-shirt that we made in 1998, and that experience of living and working in the factory, and even that earlier experience of the dilemma of trying to be artistic, trying to make a living, was really sort of the bedrock of why we started Brooklyn Industries, and that that should be like a guiding principle that, that makes us able to make certain decisions and also enables to do certain projects. So I'll sort of walk you through um, the different things that we do to uh, exemplify uh, Live, Work, Create. This is um, what, what happened after uh, we had the factory was in 2000, uh, my partner, a little bit before 2000, my partner Vahab was um, in a Starbucks in, uh, in Manhattan. And he, he sort of tells a story like this. He says that he was in a Starbucks and he was really warm. Now, most people wouldn't think that it, that wouldn't be strange to be warm in a Starbucks because Starbucks are usually warm. But 
The difference was we were living in the factory and there was no heat in the place that we were living in the factory. So to be really warm in a Starbucks was great. It, we were mostly cold in the factory. And he said, well, it, a light bulb sort of went off in his head and he said, well, why don't we open up a retail store so that we can be warm all the time? I mean, that's sort of his funny, that's sort of his funny, his funny story, like I wanted to be warm all the time, let's open up a retail store. I think that why I drew this diagram for you is because I think it more has to do with this, but I still like the story of getting warm in a Starbucks. Um, and in the top, you can see my, my little scribbles describe wholesale. So on the left, you have the factory or design studio. Then you go to a trade show, and then the buyers come, and the buyers come from their stores, either their boutiques, or they come from their department stores, and then they sell the product to their customers. Then the customers tell them, usually through reports, usually through like, we sold 80 black shirts yesterday, black shirts must be really hot. They that, that data then goes back to the buyers who then go back to the trade show, who then come to your booth and say, black shirts are really hot, please make more black shirts. So what ends up happening and what we found was that often our creative ideas ended up getting watered down because the buyers come and they say, I'd like 600 pieces of that, but can you make the strap longer or can you make it in plaid? And all of a sudden, you're making product for the buyers who theoretically know everything about their customer. But you can see I drew the one, two, three. There's three steps then between you as a wholesaler, designer, and your customer. And that felt, that started to feel being sort of a controlling artistic person wanting to know everything and really communicate directly to our customers. That felt too far away. It felt like we were losing the creative process and what retail does, what vertical retailing, and vertical retailing is, is just you're designing the things for your own store versus a boutique where you're buying things from other people. And we're a vertical retailer. Um, uh, J. Crew is a vertical retailer. Not that we're like J. Crew, but they're both, we're both vertical retailers. So in the bottom, in the bottom scenario, you have the factory design. And then you have retail, and then you have the product, and there's the direct line. And I and I think there's also if you spent if you sp if you're like us in the early days, and you also work in the store, then you have a direct feedback from your customers coming back to you. And that was the experience that we had when we opened our first store in 2000. Is that a we knew half of the people who came in, and b they you could see what they were buying, and c they they could talk to you and say, wow, that's really fabulous. And you could talk to them and say, this was my idea. Or you could say, I'm so sorry, this doesn't fit so great. This is what we were thinking. And all of a sudden, we had a direct feedback from the customer to us. And that was something that I had never thought about with, with retail. I didn't want to open a store. I thought, I'm, I have this fantastic education. The last thing I want to do is be a shop owner. The last thing I want to do is work a till. And I realized the first day that we opened our store that this was really fun. And what was fun about it was not selling necessarily the bag to the customer, but that you could talk specifically to the customer, and the customer could talk specifically back to you. And that made me think, well, if we can talk directly to the customer, we can say lots of things to our customer. And we can say lots of things <coughs> not just in our clothing and our design, but also with our ideology, also with this idea of being creative and artistic. And a store enables us to talk more directly to our customer. Um, just going back, this is, uh, this, is the one of, this is one of the first billboard bags. You can see the M um, and then the lion. Uh, that's from Marlboro. Um, so that, that was one of the billboard bags. Um, the other thing that happened uh, when we opened stores um, that I thought was very interesting as we started to open more stores, this is the, this is the uh, second store that we opened, it's the store in Park Slope, is um, what I'm referring to you guys as the story of the glass window, which is um, we, in the beginning when we opened stores, we couldn't afford much rent. Um, and we were lucky in that we started in Brooklyn because we found opportunities for stores that were inexpensive in emerging neighborhoods. And that seemed 
to make a lot of sense to us, you know, that a lot of artists moved to Brooklyn, a lot of creative people moved to Brooklyn because of the economy of Brooklyn and because of its proximity to Manhattan, which then meant that there was a lot of people living in an area that was under retailed so that we could open stores where artists were and where we thought our community was inexpensively so we could be a kind of from the bottom up community based retailer and people we could afford to be there and people would shop in our store. And one time a woman came to me and she said, I was so thankful that you opened this store on Fifth Avenue and Union, this is on Fifth and Union in Park Slope. I was like, wow, really? Why, why were you so thankful? And she said, well, you were the first store that didn't have a gate on your window in that neighborhood. That you were the first store that said, we don't need to have a closeted gate that comes over the window. You can, you know, and it was lighter at night and it was safer at night and it felt very welcoming and you had great customer service. And all of a sudden this idea of the, the cogency of a store um, being part of a revitalization of a neighborhood. The idea that you put a store on a corner in an emerging neighborhood or on a neighborhood that's changing and the store is productive, that the store is positive. So where there was maybe closed storefronts before, there are no longer closed storefronts. And then this idea of um, the store as a hub came into our thought process, which is it's a meeting point, it's a central point where people come. Again, you can tell people ideas, but it's, an, it's a place where people come to gather, and that's where this idea of community retailing comes up, like this idea that you put a store in a community, and the store has an obligation to the community, and the community doesn't have an obligation to shop, but there's a mutual synergy. You hire people from the community, and then you also give ideas back to the community, and the community gives ideas back to you, but it's very neighborhood-based, and it's very localized, um, which is quite different than this idea that I'm going to open up a store in Paris, and I'm gonna open up a store in San Francisco. And I think then that the responsibility to the community that's shopping in your store becomes slightly different if you think of yourself as being a community retailer. So this is just sort of, I'll just run through this. This, this is how we grew. So in 2000, I told you how we stopped. We, we act, and we ended up closing wholesale, and we also ended up closing the factory, which is, I can discuss more, but was basically pretty much an economic decision. Um, and also, we couldn't run retail and wholesale at the same time. So in 2001, we opened up our first store in Williamsburg. Um, and then we opened about 1.5 stores per year after that. In 2006, um, Cranes gave us the Small Business Award, and we were um, on the Inc. 500 list for the fastest growing company. Uh, 2008, we opened our first location um, outside of New York in Chicago, again in a neighborhood. In 2009, we decided to power all of our stores uh, by 100% wind, and we also opened a store in Portland. And then this year, um, We've opened a store in, uh, in Philadelphia, and also we're going to open a store in Portland. Um, so we grew from basically no stores in 2000 to 14 stores now, um, but all organically and sort of through this, this same process. Um, I'm gonna take a, sort of a side venture into this idea of localism versus globalism, which I think is very interesting for our business. So the, 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 and then I'll return to sort of the community uh, bit later, but localism versus globalism. Um, you know, this, this was sort of an idea that I've been trying to grapple with, and I think people grapple with a lot. It, it's sort of a dilemma of how do you stay local and how do you remain true to the community that you're in, but then also how do you, how do you source product and how do you think globally? Um, and the shift for us became pretty, pretty soon we started sourcing globally and we source right now in China, in Peru, in Mexico and in the US. And it's pretty equally distributed between those countries. But very quickly we, began, we became a global, a global sourcing company and most, most 
clothing, almost all clothing retailers are global retail sources. I mean, hardly anybody except American Apparel is, is localized. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions around this, like how can Brooklyn Industries that has this manufacturing base in New York now be sourcing globally? And you know, from the beginning, what how we've thought about this issue is sort of twofold. One fold is um, if we if our company is really based on being creative and artistic and designing clothes that we think are really interesting, then we need to source ethically and well and personally, um, but we need to source where people are making clothes, where people are making our kind of clothes. I think also because we be became a community retailer in the beginning, price point was always important. We wanted to be accessible when we opened our first store in Williamsburg. There was a lot of, there weren't a lot, but there was maybe two or three boutiques, and their average price point was $110, $120, even $140, and we thought, no, if we want to be accessible to a lot of people, we have to be in that $58, $68, $78 price point, which means we have to source, we have to source wide. We have to source like our co competition. And I think what, how we do it differently or how I like to think that we do it differently is that we get on a plane, which is me on the left, taking a picture of me on the plane, kind of looking terrible and jet lagged, and we go to the places that we source. So we're only sourcing from seven factories outside of the U.S. And our director of production goes there twice a year, and I go there once a year. And we travel to them. We sit down. We look at the working conditions. We have dinner. You can see us having dinner, hopefully not getting, any, not getting sick from our dinner. Um, but we, we, take a very, we try to take a very personalized approach and a very being involved with our with our um, with our vendor approach, so that's sort of where inherently you become global very very quickly, even as a small company. Um, and if anyone's read um, Thomas Friedman's book or Thomas Friedman's work, um, what is it? The the world is flat. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but that was sort of an interesting book. You know, this this sort of economic engagement. Um, the democratization that you see a lot with with globalization, but then the dilemmas that happen, and this is sort of a constant hot button issue for us, and something that we're sort of constantly discussing. Um, on the other side of localism, or er, is uh, things that we do to engage in the community. Um, here, this is an event that we did last year, and this was, uh, it was called Go Local, and it was a summer event, and we engaged 10 stores near 10 of our stores. At that time, we had 10 stores, and they were all boutique stores. They were all stores that didn't sell clothing, but somehow were single owners, so say the Soho store was partnered with Housing Works. Our Smith Street store was, was partnered with a chocolate store. Um, and what we did was we highlighted those stores and we did cross promotions. So we shared our lists and we made t-shirts and we did giveaways and that was our answer to the recession. And I think what we felt was um, our neighborhoods were suffering so much. We were suffering a lot, but I think we had more capability to deal with the recession than a lot of the small mom and pop stores that we saw around. So our answer to that was this campaign, Go Local, which is sort of this idea, shop locally, support these other people around us, and let's have this synergy between us and these other stores. Um, this is another way that we've done a lot of marketing and, and in engagement with um, localism, which is talking to our neighbors. So we're not very systematic. We don't really, I mean, Nicole can speak to this, we don't really have a master marketing plan. I'm sure we should have a master marketing plan, but a lot of what we do is just like people we run into. And we, we, we sort of like it that way because actually it becomes very generative. So. The store in Soho is right opposite Housing Works. Housing Works is a, a non-for-profit, and they sell, they have a lot of thrift stores around the city, but they also have this one store that's fantastic, it's on Crosby, and they sell books, and the proceeds from the books go to um, AIDS awareness, to uh, people living with AIDS. It's a great non-for-profit. Anyway, they're our neighbor. They've been our neighbor for four years. We know them, they come into the store, our manager goes to their store, 
So when they had an anniversary party, we designed a T-shirt for them. Um, it, the the T-shirt said, New York is dying. They felt like it was a little bit too edgy, so they didn't do it for the anniversary party, but we did it six months later, and it did very well, and the proceeds from the T-shirt went back to Housing Works. But that's just one example where it, it's, we won't, that's how we, I mean, that's how it happened because we couldn't afford to hire people and come up with some grand scheme. But it's sort of like the person you're next to, even metaphorically as a store, ends up being the person you associate with and the cause that you then cross collaborate with. Um, so that's housing works. Uh, we also do t shirt collaborations. We do a lot of collaborations with t shirts because they're very fast, they're graphic, and they're very agile and people love t-shirts and and there's not a light there's not a long cycle leading up to t-shirts you can design and print a t-shirt we print most of our t-shirts in red hook so you can design and print a t-shirt in a month um, and have it be a cause related t-shirt what we try to a lot of people come to up to us and say oh we have this charity event will you do a t-shirt no we're not interested in being you know like a, a gift shop for nonprofits like that's not very interesting to us but what is interesting is people coming to us and we cross collaborate so we say well what are you interested in what are we interested in how can our designers also be inspired by this by this thing this this issue and then how can we advertise it to our customers through signage in the store, on the website, and then the proceeds go back to the organization. So it's very different from normal corporate giving. A, we can't, af we can't afford to corporate give, like we're a very small company, even though we have 13 stores. We're a small company, we can't afford to just give out money, but what we can afford to do is to use our creative team and use our creative energy and to use our stores to bring uh, issues to light and to uh, give money through the through the product back to the back to the nonprofit. So here, this is Eat Local, and this came out of our buyer. Our buyer was really interested in localization of food, and she found Just Food, this nonprofit, and they got together and they said, "Well, let's highlight farms that are serving neighborhoods, um, and let's do a T-shirt." And 20% of the proceeds from the shirt, um, which is you know kind of probably about 75% of what the shirt made go back to Just Foods. This is another example. This is Recycle a Bike, another local organization in Brooklyn, um, and we made a whole series of product that had more bike lanes on it. Um, the proceeds from more bike lanes went back to Recycle a Bike. Again, it has to do with our customer, too. Our customer is really interested in food, in sustainability, in bicycling, um, in in AIDS awareness. I mean, these are sort of issues that interest, we think they're issues that interest our customers. They interest us, um, but we know that that's, they respond well to this. So it's also our way of dialoguing with our customer. Um, this is uh, another big thing that we've been doing um, recently. Um, you know, from the very first billboard bag, we've always been very conscious of uh, recycling, but, but less recycling. So recycling is, is often where you take something, you make something else, and it becomes something. Upcycling is different, and upcycling is sort of a new word. The billboard bag would be called upcycling. We didn't know that when we made the billboard bag, um, but upcycling is when you take something that already exists and you make it better. You make it different and better. Um, but how we've always thought about upcycling is from art. I mean, if you think of Duchamp, I hope everyone knows Marcel Duchamp, but if you think of Duchamp, you know, he takes a bicycle wheel, he puts it on a stool, and it becomes art. He says it's art, so it is art. And it's this idea of taking something, uh, you know, taking something every day, the urinal. He takes the urinal, he puts it in a gallery, he adds some text. It is art, it is concept, it is context. Um, and for us, we obviously couldn't take, you know, we couldn't take this paper and then try to sell it for, to you for $300 because we're not running a gallery. Like that, that wouldn't really work. But what we could do is use that same principle of taking things that had been discarded or taking things 
they also have the advantage of being free, usually taking things that are free and changing them and morphing them and making them part of the store. Um, so for years we've been doing this in our store windows. Often our store windows are very ordinary objects that we recycle, we change, we paint, and we put back into the window. Um, but in this instance, in the last three stores, we said, well, how can we take this concept of upcycling and of changing material and make it part of our fixturing process? So put it on the walls of our store. So here um, you can see, oh, this picture is kind of bad, but, but you can see on the left um, all, all of right here, all of these, um, that's all pallet wood. So the boxes that come to our warehouse are all on pallets, which is, everyone knows pallets, right? This is the boxes on the floor. So what we did was we had uh, a, con not a contractor, the guy who does all of our plumbing and stuff, what we asked him to do a sample, which was he took all of our pallets, he cut them up, he, re uh, he, he reorganized them and then painted them, and they became our fixtures for our store. Um, it was, it was a lot cheaper than using, you know, uh, uh, sustainable wood. And it was sort of a progression because our Chelsea store, we made from old sustainable wood that was imported from Finland, so sustainable forestry. But it still felt a little strange. Like, you're celebrating it, but it's still being imported from Finland. It's still new wood, no matter how you slice it. But this was interesting to us because it's pallet wood. Pallet wood is really nasty. It has nails in it. It's the worst type of wood. But we're changing it, and we're making it better and nicer. So we thought, we thought that was very interesting. So we've now done three stores with uh, this upcycled material. The other thing that's interesting is we took over the store. This is our store in Philly. We took it over from a, uh, a, a tile company, and they left all their fixtures there. And uh, there was lots of debates going back. My partner, Vahab, wanted to do the whole store and only the fixtures from the tile company. And I kept saying, but we're not a tile company. We have to hang the clothes. We can't fold the clothes. So we kind of reached a compromise. Um, and all of, we reused all of their material, um, but not wholly. Like, it's going to go into different stores. But that's sort of the spirit. The spirit is don't throw anything out. Try and reuse it. Try as much as possible to use the materials that you are and look at it in, a, in an artistic way. I mean, it's, there's Duchamp, there's later, there's, um, you know, there's uh, um, uh, even Gordon Matta Clark, which, who's a little bit more esoteric, but Gordon Matta Clark has sort of the same approach, which is like, how do I take an abandoned building and, and draw a circle in the wall and all of a sudden light comes in and it is sculpture. Um, you know, Andy Warhol did it very, very obviously with, with his sort of pop culture, but that's slightly different. But this idea that in a company that is all about production, that is all about producing things for people to buy, you can minimize your waste by just looking around and, and thinking of things differently. Uh, this is the tile over here that you can see the tile from the company that was here before. And then this is the finished store. This is, this is how it looked three weeks ago when we opened. Um, and here's the front of the store with those, uh, those fixtures that you saw all lined up. We did figure out how to use them. We, we piled them on top of each other, and they became like a mini gallery when you come into the store. It looks really beautiful, and we didn't throw anything out. Um, another way that we use LiveWorks uh, Create, another way that we talk about LiveWork Create is by engaging uh, this is sort of a new thing that we're doing, but we're engaging artists and writers and photographers and architects and highlighting people who we think are interesting and exemplify live, work, create. Um, and this idea, again, was not sort of a marketing thing that we just pulled out of a hat, but this is uh, Joanna Rakoff. Uh, she's a young writer. Her paperback book just came out. You, if you go into a Barnes & Noble, you'll see it on the paperback, uh, uh, the paperback area. Um, she, uh, she also lived in Williamsburg for a time. She's a writer. She wrote this book called A Fortunate Age, which is about young people in Williamsburg coming of age. Her publisher at Scribner's uh, started flowing us books. Like, it, it was like Harry Potter, like when Harry Potter was supposed to go to Hogwarts and 
uh, you know, his the Dud the Dursleys wouldn't let him go, and then over, everywhere he went, there was like a letter coming through the door. It was like this with her publisher. Everywhere, every store got a fortunate age. Five people at our office got a fortunate age, and finally. I was like, I have to read this book. I don't know why she's sending us books. We're not a publisher. And you know, there was always a letter saying, we want, to, we want to collaborate. We want to do something. So I took it home over the weekend, and I read it. And it was, it was a wonderful book about the same period of time as when we opened our first store. And I think that was the connection. So we met in a coffee shop with Joanna. And it's like, well, it's a little strange what you want to do because I've read some of the criticisms of your book, and some of the criticisms say that you're too hip, you're too trendy, and you know, it's describing this like hipster life in Williamsburg. And that's the exact same criticism that we get all the time is that we're too hip, like those hipsters, oh no, those hipsters. I was like, Are you sure you want to be affiliated with us? And she's like, Yes, I want to be affiliated with you. So Again, we, we approached it in a very unique way. We said, well, why don't we make a T-shirt? And why don't you put text from your book that you think would resonate with our customer? And why don't we find a nonprofit that we can donate the proceeds of the T-shirt to the nonprofit? And why don't we have a book signing? And then why don't you write for our blog? And then why don't we take pictures of you and put it in the store? And won't that be fun? And it, it was. I mean, it was... It was fun, that, that's sort of downplaying what it was. But so on her shirt, she said, but she was in New York, that was all that mattered, um, which if you read your, the book, does is very poignant. And then we chose, she chose 826 NYC, which is an offshoot of 826 Valencia, which is a nonprofit out of um, Mission, Mission San Francisco. Um, and they do, uh, they encourage young people to be writers. Basically, they help with writing projects. So the proceeds of the T-shirt went back to 826 NYC. And she's just a great person. You know, she has kids. She's engaged in the community. And she blogged for us, and she wrote a lot about living in New York and the dilemmas of living in New York and trying to be a creative person. Again, for our brand, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm really kind of going all over the place, but I hope that's OK with you. Um, this is how art kind of always influences us. And I, and I put this slide up here because I wanted to show you that that early days of being an artist have been very important for our company. And I think have been very important for sort of how we approach the world. And I think how that's interesting is often things that you do earlier in your life kind of end up recycling back. Um, so here on the right is a campaign for fall where, where we have two models. Uh, they're in Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn. On the left is Chris Marker's La Jete, which um, a lot of people, a lot of art critics have always been interested in this movie. It's a kind of vaguely non-narrative uh, French film made in the 60s, um, has uh, sort of end of the world, uh, an end of the world ethos to it. It's a, about a man who loses his, everybody's lost their memory and they're trying to find a way back in time. Um, it's very important for art history. It's very important for cinematography. It's a movie that I've always been very interested in. But what we try to do is, so that's a personal thing for me, but what we do in our collaborations is we, we bring, you know, I will make everyone watch this film. So it's a way of bringing art and context back into what is really a, a kind of commercial environment. And I think that that's part of our spirit. We also use, we always try and use New York City as our backdrop. So I love how a lot of companies, they travel very, very far. And what we were interested in doing is how could we travel nowhere and say a lot. Um, this, this was our last photo shoot. We took it in uh, a hotel in Manhattan where every single uh, room is painted by an artist. It's the most crazy place ever. Uh, but it's one of those places where if you just turn around you know, the concrete playground down the street could be the most interesting place for a fashion shoot. You don't need to have all the glory of traveling. It's also very expensive, but it's sort of this upcycling idea only with location. It's like how to make something really grotty interesting or how to make something very familiar, unfamiliar. So we always imagine that we're like a Danish film crew and we're coming to New York and we're saying, what's the most interesting thing if I was a Danish, Danish film crew? Probably 
our neighborhood right next to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Okay, that's where we should take our pictures. And I think that's just an, another instance of sort of looking at things differently. This is, I just wanted to show you what we're interested in right now. Right now for fall, uh, well, we're, we're working on spring 2010, but so this is in the interim. We're really interested in uh, American dock workers, uh, New York dock workers. So we were interested in immigration and Ellis Island um, and sort of in this idea of, again, what is in our immediate environment and how can we incorporate that back into our collections. Um, and then this, this is a little hard to see, but I wanted to, I, I was thinking how can I share with you ideas that are not related particularly to our business right now. I mean, most of my life is how can we, how can we communicate our ideas, but a lot of my life is, you know, are all the stores staffed? Uh, did the product come in on time? Uh, did we make our month? Is the bank happy? Are all our employees happy? Uh, you know, can we make payroll? I mean, 90% of my brain power is probably occupied by that. But I try and preserve 10% for the fun stuff, even if it never becomes a reality. So I wanted to share with you as a parting thing, the thing that I'm thinking if I just tell enough people might become a reality. <laughs> Because there's so, sort of this power of like, if I tell enough people, it will become real. So this is, this is my idea that I had, uh, uh, and I've been telling everybody at headquarters too, and everyone thinks it's a great idea, so maybe it really will become a reality. Um, but I, I love planes because I get to think on planes. So I was traveling a week ago, and I said, oh, we can make a Brooklyn Industries headquarters, and somehow we can get a building. And it would be ideal if it was on the waterfront. That would be really ideal. And we could have different sections to the building. So we could have our design studio and office. We can have um, our bias art space. I didn't really talk about that, but we have a lot of art in our stores, and we call it bias, which is Brooklyn Industries art space. We can also have a shop where we have ideas, like new ideas in our shop. We can have a lab, like somehow people could come kind of like Etsy has a lab, but we could have an even cooler lab, which is it could be like a new business forum or it could be a resource for entrepreneurs or it could be some place where people who have ideas for live, work, create could come and do stuff. It would be a lab. And then, of course, we could have coffee and food, ideally Stumptown coffee, uh, because I think people who work for us would really like permanent coffee on the, on the location and also all the tourists who are coming to this location would really like coffee. And then lastly, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could manufacture a game? Wouldn't it be great if we could start up a small manufacturing line of like eight to 10 people um, making those billboard bags a game because it would be the heritage and then tourists would really want to come, which would be really good for the brand. And that's, that's a lot how we think, only this is just one idea and it would probably cost a lot of money, but you know, that's sort of the energy behind our brand is like, what if, and then sometimes the what if uh, becomes a reality. So this is my what if. So with that, I will open up the floor to, to uh, any questions. Interested, but a little bit disappointed in your reason for going global with production. Because if you would have had the, the approach that you had to production of saying, we should be producing where clothes is being made, if you had had that approach to opening your stores, you wouldn't necessarily be, have been pioneering, for example, the, the glass, first glass shop on Fifth Avenue and Union. And so I'm wondering um, why you had this very kind of <coughs> innovative, trend-setting approach to where you localized yourself and did it necessarily continue that with the production uh, of the company? Um, I think the, the production part of the company was pragmatic, which was that we realized that we couldn't run a fact, running factories, especially, I mean, we could, never we could never, ever, ever produce all of the things that are in our store. So the only way that we could do retail and do what we do was say if we only did bags, but there was sort of, I didn't, I didn't walk through why we closed the factory. Um, manufacturing and, you know, in this country, if you look at where manufacturing is, it's mostly out of LA. There's almost, har there's hardly any manufacturing out of New York. Um, 
And the reason, and uh, there is some manufacturing, um, but it tends to be of two kinds. One kind is in the garment center, which is also starting to go away. Um, and it's very expensive. I mean, very expensive, like 30 to $40. And then there's some manufacturing in Chinatown, and there's some manufacturing in Brooklyn, and there's some, there's some sort of scattered manufacturing. The manufacturing outside of, I've, we found that the manufacturing outside of, uh, outside of the garment center is of very poor quality um, and unsupportable and often shop like, uh, sweatshop like. Um, like there's some manufacturing, uh, you know, we, we have manufactured quite a bit in New York, but it's often with very little success outside manufacturers. Um, we used to manufacture t-shirts. The guy went out of business. We've had a lot of people go out of business sort of slowly over the years. We used to make a whole line of clothing in Midtown. First, um, unfortunately, our cutter went out of business, then our pattern maker went out of business, and then the manufacturer went out of business. So there's, a, there's an economic scale to, to subcontracting within New York. Um, there's, there's also the problem, you know, we realized pretty early on that we were not manufacturers, like that, that it's a very different discipline than retailing and designing. That you have to have a certain mindset. It's a lot about efficiency. It's a lot about piecework. It's a lot about um, it's a lot about how do I get this thing through the line. It, it's a totally different mental process. But there was the other big problem, which is we couldn't find labor. So even with our small factory, so even when we had we got up to about twelve sewers, it was very hard for us to find twelve sewers in New York City who were legal, who spoke English, who we could communicate with, and who were stable employees. Uh, I mean, that was a, that was a big problem. Bags is quite specialized, so I think it's slightly different with t-shirts, but bags is very specialized. Um, so it was hard for us to find people who could even do what we wanted them to do. And it wasn't as much, it was interesting, because it wasn't as much the economics, it was more, um, there aren't that many people who sew in New York you know, in that way. Um, and what, what, well, our experience also was that, again, immigration, immigration would keep coming. They never came to us, but immigration would keep coming and they would shut down factories mm -hmm. because there weren't legal workers. But hiring legal workers was more difficult than we thought, which is that people would often come with their cousin's social security card or they wouldn't come and they'd say, I'll bring it in three weeks. And we never could, if we continued being manufacturers, like we never could have, we never could have opened the first store. We, we, we couldn't have done both. Like we, we economically couldn't have done both. We didn't want to do both. And then we realized like, it, why we started the business was not to manufacture. Why we started the business was to create things and to be artistic. Um, and I think that was a big divide for Great. us. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Um, hello, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. I have two thoughts. First of all, I applaud your idea of the headquarters. I just got back from Brazil, where a very famous jeweler induces people to come and visit H. Stern's premises. Not okay. that I could afford. And it's the same idea. You watch the craftsmen, and as you move down the building, um, you come to the sort of less expensive jewelry. I didn't buy anything, but the idea was that, that it's, it's a way of life, you know, and it, it's, so, um, it's so appealing to visitors. And I think it would be fascinating for people to watch the way things are being made and then to have coffee and, and have a whole tourist experience. I think it's a lovely idea. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, do you actually have a shop now in Grand Central Station? We do, yes. Because I wondered how does that um, shop, which I've been into, where the staff are very nice, how does that accord with your idea of communality? Because it's such a transient population going back and forth in the station. Yeah. Um you know, it's interesting. Grand Central State, we, I never would have thought of opening a store in Grand Central Station, but Grand Central, Grand Central Station Terminal came to us at Christmas and they said, would you like to open a store? And we said, God, we, we had a lot of discussions like, we're local, we're community-based, how are we going to go into, like, are we selling out by, by going into Grand Central? And we did have lots of discussions about that. And then we thought, and then, you know, it was sort of interesting. And then we started to get really interested in transportation. At least I got really, inter I got really interested in that idea. And our architect, uh, the guy who does architecture who works for us, got really interested in this idea, too, of 
this idea of mobility, the idea that people are constantly moving and that um, maybe we could think of community slightly differently as a, as a moving feast, you know, something that sort of starts here but goes there. And this idea that a passageway is just as interesting as an endpoint, you know, that passing through something um, is maybe is maybe the thing. I mean, what, what going back to Gordon Matta Clark, he had this, uh, he, he, he did this project uh, again in the 60s where he bought spaces, apparently there were all these spaces in New York City that were uh, between buildings that you couldn't, you, odd lots, somebody's saying odd lots. So you couldn't build, thank you, you couldn't, you couldn't build anything there, but he could buy it and talk about the space between. Um, and we started to think, that's sort of how the shipping, the, the, the pallet wood came about, is we started to think about um, elevating places that you pass through. I mean, it could have just been an intellectual exercise that justified it a really cool, nice store. <laughs> um, but, it, but I was also interested in, you know, in London and Heathrow, the design and the architecture that they put into, I think it's Heathrow 4 or Heathrow 5, the terminal is so fantastic and it's such a wonderful experience and they're such good retailers that they put into those stores and I thought, well, why is it that in the US we don't glorify our transport hubs? Like, why is it that we actually, um, we make them less than what they could be? We make them dirty. We put retail in there that isn't that special. Um, and I, that, that was sort of our, ment that was our mental process. Um, and we were also interested in, you know, all the people who are going out to Long Island, like, would they, would they, would they like our clothes? Would they relate to our clothes? That, that then became a, a good challenge for us um, that we wanted to take on. Thank you. First of all, um, thank you for this wonderful tour. <laughs> so, uh, it's very inspiring, uh, at least to me. But I, I think everybody ag agrees. Um, my question to you is, um, I love the local um, issue, of course, uh, very much. And uh, um, being anchored in a, in a a certain neighborhood uh, that that's very appealing uh, not only to me to many um, how is that and I like the way you describe how close you were to your customers that you could talk with them uh, find out what they liked I mean so it wasn't a middle man right to, uh, to separate you from uh, them um, how do you manage to still get the feedback from them and uh, uh, be so close to them now that you have so many stores? And uh, I assume that uh, you cannot be in every single one. Or well, um, well, I, I, I actually I live above one of, st one of the stores. <laughs> so um, when I pick up my kids from school, we, we often, maybe three out of five nights a week, we stop in the store on the way home that that I mean, I, I'm not particularly proud of that, and maybe that will change. But um, we're, I'm in, so I'm I'm in the stores because I happen to live above a store. Um, so that's that's one thing, and it is a struggle. And we try, I try and go into a. My goal after Christmas was I have to go into a store once a day, but that's been very difficult. You know, mm -hmm. aside from stopping and going from home, so I try to go at least once a week, if not twice or three times a week, and spend an hour or two hours. Um, but I think it becomes, I think it's definitely a struggle. Um, and why it's a struggle is because being a vertical retailer is very, it's a very intense business. It, there's a lot of different components to the, the business. There's distribution, there's manufacturing, there's um, design, there's, you know, uh, there's audit, there's, there's real estate, you know, all, all of these, there's marketing, I mostly spoke about marketing, but there's, there's all these different facets to it that are always pulling you away from the store, only we, I always say to everybody, we can't forget that the stores are why we're here, like that, and the customers are why we're here. So I do try and spend as much time as I can 
humanly possible while still doing my job in the store. But we also have a lot of like feedback mechanisms that we have. We have customer service cards. We have secret shops. We have manager feedback forms that we do. And every single night, the manager writes a couple paragraphs that says, this is doing well, this isn't doing well. So we have lots of ways that the customers can talk to us. But I think you can't replace like working behind the cash register and you also can't replace just spending an afternoon on the floor because um, that that's the way that you know that's the way that you know what's happening I think for me also you know living living in Brooklyn and I you know I'm a fastidious sort of studier of what people are wearing and how they're wearing our product so you can sort of be with a customer while on your on the train and I think also new media has helped that as well I mean I wish people would write more to us it's sort of amazing that we dialogue we try and dialogue a lot with our customer through blogging and through twittering but often people don't write back unless there's a problem or unless there's like a controversial issue you know this last uh, this last campaign, we used a lady that we thought was fine, but our customers are saying is too skinny. And on the one hand, we were sort of upset because how did we overlook that she was too skinny? What were we thinking? We just we she looked so interesting. We were just focusing on how interesting she was. We hadn't focused on the fact that maybe our customers were thinking she was skinny. But then after discussing it for a couple of hours, we said, well, at least they're talking to us. At least people are saying stuff, you know, and Facebook had this like this long conversation between the customers saying, how could Brooklyn Industries use a skinny model? And then a guy would tell you, oh, she has feelings too. She's not that skinny. <laughs> oh, yes, she is. She's really skinny. You should really do this. And it was like, you know, at least 20 pages of like, not 20 pages, I'm exaggerating, at least a whole bunch of entries. And I think, so talking to your customer and it becomes different, so it changes as you grow, so you try to connect to that initial moment, um, but it's also amazing, sometimes the managers think they really know, and then they, you know, sometimes they say, well, this shirt, actually, this, this one's doing great, everything I'm wearing is doing great, so I can't give an example, but like, imagine this wasn't doing well, sometimes they think that this is really, they're like, this is a bestseller, and you go, yeah, but you only sold three in the last month, it's really not a bestseller, so, you know, it's like, what are the customers saying to us? And also, but how are they voting? How are they, how are they voting with their wallet? I mean, that's, that's another way of talking. Thank you. Hi, I've really enjoyed the presentation. However, I have two uh, questions. And one is, how do you actually measure that uh, you're only using wind power for your stores? I mean, does Con Edison have some green Something. button you can press? Oh, God. See, this was the slide that I added after I was running to the taxi. I was like, we didn't have the wind power slide. So what happens? Um, that's a really good question. How do we measure it? Um, how it works is, and it took us, I'm looking at Nicole, because Nicole and I worked on this project, and I, I kept saying, Nicole, Nicole, Nicole. But what, how, it took us a while to figure out how to do it. But basically, it's really easy. All you do is call Con Edison, who then connects you with Con Edison Solutions. Con Edison Solutions is a subsidiary of Con Edison. And what they do is, imagine you spend $10,000 on electricity a month. They then go purchase $10,000, it's $10,000, it's the units of electricity, it's not the dollar volume. So say you use, what's the unit of electricity? You use kilowatts. kilowatts. So you say you use 10,000 kilowatts of electricity, Con Edison Solutions then goes and purchases 10,000 kilowatts of wind power from wind power farms and puts it into the grid. So I don't know how you would measure, like it's not like wind comes to our stores, <laughs> <laughs> but it, as I understand it, it goes into the grid. And we, ha we have a diagram on our website that does this because we get this question all the time. And it was, it was true. And I went through this whole thing because there's sort of a hierarchy also in the sustainability movement of like, like there's green power and then there's really green power. And I was described at once, it's like wind power, you know, there's wind, there's solar, there's thermal, and then there's, um, and then there's also like recycled water. So there's a hydro. 
And it seems like there's kind of a hierarchy, but it depends on who you speak to. Because in the beginning, we just did this hydro-wind combination. And then we were having all these debates like, well, is hydro really sustainable enough? And there was lots of conversations saying, no, it's not sustainable, because you have to put energy in to recycle the water to then get the hydro part of the hydroelectricity. But then there is good hydroelectricity, which is a waterfall. And then we just decided that's way too complicated for us and a little bit complicated for our, our customers, and let's just do the wind. And what we did was we put um, wind decals on our window to make it really easy, like wind, a wind decal. <laughs> and that seems to work, but that's how it works, as I understand it. But anybody can get wind in their apartment, and any business can get wind. Um, all you need to do is call Con Edison Solutions. And what's interesting is, since we use wind, our energy costs have gone down. So we've saved money by going to wind, which I, I still don't understand because it's more expensive. But somehow, I think because we locked in a price, we started paying attention as opposed to having a varying price. So we started spending a lot of attention. Like four people were working on it, and we were like, wind, got to lock in the price. And over the last year, we've saved money since we switched to wind. So it's, it's been good. Can I, I just have one, the second question, just a quick one, and that is, what's the ratio between online sales versus in the stores? Because you were not talking about online before. Yeah, um, online is, I would love online to be like 15%, but unfortunately, it's still good, but it's about 6 or 7% of our business. Um, so we, we think of it as an amazing store, but a small store. Yeah. Um, I kind of have two questions as yeah. well. First, is there any upcycling that goes into your actual fashions? And second, when you decided to do fashion, like, did you bring in designers? Did you go back to school? Like, what kind of training and background did you feel like you had to get before you could pursue that? Um, so, do, so the first question, do we upcycle into our clothes? We discussed it a lot, and we don't upcycle into our clothes. We do use organic, so a lot of our, about 30% of our t-shirts are printed on organic, and about 5% of the rest of our clothes are on organic, uh, our organic cotton. We also have a shirt that's made out of recycled, uh, partly recycled material. It's like crushed cans goes into the shirt somehow. Um, but, uh, sorry. but no, we, you know, we, we talk about it, we've done it in the past, we have done it in the past, it's, um, and it, it's definitely a movement in the industry, it's an enormous, it's an enormous amount of work. Um, yeah, we had a whole phase, I'm just remembering now, we had a whole phase where we used to like put things on bags and put things on, te you weren't here, but like, we, yeah, we had a whole sort of wave, and it was getting very crafty, like, that's the issue with upcycling clothes, is it tends to be in the craft zone. And as a company, stylistically, we're not very crafty. So we did, we had like a three year cycle of doing all this upcycled clothes, but it was looking very patchworky. Um, but it would, be, it would be great, like it would be great uh, to develop, you know, like what if it could be all recycled denim. Um, but I, I think for us, we're still small, you know, we're still making only 300 to 500 of a garment. So it's difficult for us to be a leader, um, or we don't really have the resources to be a leader in, in uh, textile innovation. It's just, it's not really part of our focus. It, it's, it would be nice. Um, and then to your second question, did I feel like I had to go back to school? Um, I, I've never, I have designed some of our clothes. I did, I designed a couple of collections and I've designed some of the bags, but my primary focus has not been design. In the beginning, Vahab, my partner, designed, um, and I've designed a lot in that sort of, uh, let's take this and make it into something else. I, I'm more of a merchant. I mean, you, you, this is a design school, but I'm more of a merchant. So like, I, I know color, I know trend, I know what looks good and what doesn't, but I, I can't actually sit, I can, but my drawings end up like this. Like, this isn't that great for the factory. Um, so yeah, in the very beginning, in the very beginning, in the very beginning, my partner designed all the bags, and I designed some of the women's bags. Uh, but very quickly, we hired designers. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm very bullish. I don't think you need to go back to school. You just need to do it. You know? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you who your target customer was, but you just told us it was skinny people. 
Oh yes, very skinny people, <laughs> preferably size zero. <laughs> so, um, no, so who's your target customer versus who's your actual customer? Um, so in the business plan, who, do, who you're targeting? And then who are your competition and what other retailers do you sort of admire? Ah, really good questions. Um, yeah, our target, our target customer is uh, uh, 25 to 35. Um, Urban dwelling uh, likes to be creative and artistic. Um, uh, is often engaged in the arts in some way, or um, you know, is an architect or a freelancer or that kind of thing. Um, our, the reality is that it's much wider than 25 to 35. It's more like 19 to 50. But the core, like when we do our surveys, because that's really the only way you can sort of pinpoint it down. The surveys are, we are 29, 30, 31. Like that, that is our core. What's interesting is I think because of our price point, we tend to skew, um, we, we have a lot of people in education shopping with us, which I always find very interesting. Um, and I think maybe that's because of our price point and maybe that's because of our ideas. And maybe that's because of New York City that so many people are in education. Um, we. I know this physically, like our customer is very educated. Most, most of our customers have a college degree and then graduate degree. Um, you know, we, we, and then we make up these people to design for and the people we make, and we had this sort of, that's a very traditional design. I don't know if they teach you that here, but you make up a person and then you put traits on the person and sometimes you have a couple people or they do different things. Um, so we did that for a while, and we keep coming back to that, but that can also sometimes be very narrow. Like sometimes you end up not designing things that you might for them. Uh, but we try and make our imaginary people as artistic and cool and not size zero. <laughs> uh, did you have another question? Oh, who, who, who are our competition and who do I admire? So um, this is, again, if you define our competition, so, there's a couple different ways to define competition. If you define our competition as who else our people, our customers are shopping with, which in a traditional marketing be, marketing talk would be who you share your wallet with, aside from Apple. I'm just, Apple, I think, <laughs> like we sh everybody's sharing their wallet with Apple. I, you know, we should be all in technology. Um, but people are shopping with uh, Urban Outfitters, Anthropology, J. Crew. Um, they, if they feel wealthy, they're shopping with Barney's, but lately they're not really shopping with Barney's. Um, they're shopping for at Gap um, for like mainstream stuff. There are shoppers, and then they also, they also shop boutique and they shop vintage, you know, like Beacon's Closet, they do. But it's amazing how mainstream our, a lot of our customers are shopping. Um, and I think that's also interesting in terms of I didn't talk about marketing, but we used to market and all of, we used to advertise in all of these really indie magazines until we read, until we conducted surveys and realized that people are reading Vogue, J. Crew, uh, Time Out, maybe a little bit edgier, uh, The Economist, and we were, we were thinking, well, we can't afford to advertise in any of those, the New York Times, we can't afford to advertise in those people in those places, but they're not reading Vice magazine, which is what, they are, but not to the degree that they're, they're, they're more mainstream. Um, and then who, who we look at as our competition, um, you know, I don't think anybody else is doing exactly what we're doing. So we usually don't, so the designers aren't looking to these people, like the designers look to, um, look to, uh, you know, they, they look to a whole variety of places for inspiration, but who I'm focused on in terms of who's taking market share from us is Madewell by J. Crew, Martin Inosa, um, Free People, Urban Outfitters, although they're younger, Anthropology, although they're more frilly, um, but like G Star, um, Diesel's sort of in a totally different category, um, Levi's a little bit. Um, but what's interesting is when you go outside of our neighborhood stores, like in Bucktown and Portland, we're next to the same people over and over and over again. And sometimes we're the first people or sometimes we're following, but they end up being your competition just by virtue of the fact that they're next to you. Um, 
which is really boring. I mean, I think that's also where we start to use art because our teams can become very focused on other people. And what you want to do is, what I want to do is I want to get them to be less focused on other people. Like, who cares that Madewell is making a pant in 10 colors when we don't really sell pants? Like, just let Madewell do their thing. They have their customer. But who's our customer and what do they want? And really look at our selling and, you know, we will have a, a, a button-up cardigan. I mean, this, this, this shirt, this shirt is a bestseller, like hands down a bestseller. Um, and I think what we often see is things that are um, slightly more unusual will sell really well in our store. And sometimes the black cardigan won't sell as well. And maybe that's totally different from a made well. But we have to be focused on our customer and the fact that even though our customer is shopping in these other places, they might be shopping for something different in our location. And I think people are changing the way that they shop and they're, they're, they're shopping individually. So they will be buying a Mark by Mark Jacobs thing with a vintage thing, with a Brooklyn Industries coat, with, a, you know, with socks from Gap. I mean, and then they're shopping all these people. So it becomes slightly more difficult to define your competition. It's more... Um, has anyone read Blue Ocean Strategy? It's like a very business book, but it's a really great book. And it's sort of, it, and how it, what it says is a traditional marketing thing would be you'd look at your quadrant and you see where you are with your competition. But another way to look at it is to look at it more linearly and say, well, what is everyone else doing and how can I do some of those things but do a lot of other things very, very differently? And that the key is to create, is to find a hole in the market and fill that hole and do something totally different. So you look at your competition, but then you say, I'm doing something radically different. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I think we'll wrap here. Thank you so much, Thank you. Lexi. Thanks a lot.